Let me start off a kick off the panel with the leading questions. Perhaps starting from my left, Simon. Why are we here? Why is it important to consider the legal treatment and classification of blockchain and also digital tokens that underpin, underpin the technology? Simon. Is that up? Yeah. The hell that's on. Um, yes, uh, okay. Three minutes on why is everything important. Um, what you've got to understand about the way that the regulators look at this is they've got two buckets. One of them is called securities and securities regulation, and they've got a machine that does that. The other is money, and they've got machines that deal with money and payment. The problem with blockchain-based things is that some of them are fairly clearly investments, some of them are fairly clearly trying to be money, and quite a lot of them sit in the middle. And by and large, the regulators can cope with the money-like stuff, and they can even cope with the securities-like stuff. The stuff that sits in the middle is really hard, because you don't you, you, you can't apply either of your existing paradigms. So your basic approach has to be one from column A and one from column B. You can kind of see that in the recent HMT condoc. But effectively what we've got here is a whole new form of property that didn't previously exist. And I suspect we'll talk a lot more later on about how we fit that into existing legal concepts. But Fitting it into legal concepts, oddly enough, is a job that comes along later. For the regulators, fitting it into regulation is a job that matters this morning. People are being sold this stuff today. The regulator needs to know what he's going to do about it. And he knows that as he thinks about how, what to do about it, um, things are going on that will subsequently turn nasty. And just as a sort of final point, it is terribly important for everybody in this room, no matter what they do, that the regulatory system kind of works. Because when it doesn't, what happens is really unpleasant public blow-ups, which result in calls for stronger and stronger regulation, more and more interference with the market, and a bigger and bigger mess. So the regulators kind of need to get it right now as a first cut before they've done the detailed thinking. And that, that's, I think, really the answer to the question. That's why it's important. Thank you, uh, Simon. Can I hand over to you, Barbara, from your perspective? Sure. So it's probably worth just touching a little bit on what we do at WebN Group. Um, so what we're aiming to do is build businesses in the Web3 space from zero to one um, probably acting a little bit like a founder. And it's an unusual model, but it's not entirely unique. And what that means is that we are aiming to find product market fit from idea stage until it launches as a standalone business. And we have a team that's split, as John mentioned, I lead the business infrastructure team, and we're trying to help the businesses do all the things that any business needs to do, really regardless of, of what space they're in. Um, and also we have a venture team, and they come from financial services background um, or from uh, management consultancy. And one of the things that we are really focused on, and you know, the panels earlier today have talked about it, is what does your market actually need? And one of the things that they do need is real focus on what institutions are requirements because they are already regulated and if you want that adoption you need to build for those institutions and I think the way to think about it if you come from a technical background is that what we're aiming to do is almost avoid the regulatory bugs in the system in the same way as you've got to code to avoid the bugs we don't want the regulator to come along later and basically destroy what you've built because you haven't complied um, and the way we've done that, so just to give a, a concrete example, we have built um, three businesses really to date. We've been around for just over a year. Um, we've also considered and not built some other businesses for, for various reasons, which I'm sure we'll touch on. Um, one of them is a, a 
research-led deep cryptography investment business where the founders are supported by us. Um, we also helped the founding team build a DeFi protocol called Truefin. Um, and we've also built an institutional grade staking services provider called TwinStake um, that is at the stage of, of generating revenue. And there were a number of areas we looked at when we were particularly with TwinStake thinking about, you know, how can we make this institution institutional grade and then you do need to really integrate with the technology and say well what can be done for institutions they don't want to commingle their funds with anything that might be untraceable with anything that could be touching sanctioned funds um, and so we said okay great well we'll just permission all the validators and so for those who are in the room you'll know that that's you know potentially going to require a change at the at the infrastructure layer and is not going to happen very easily so for those examples, we've, we've built an escalation process um, and that very much relies on, on governance and you know, how we uh, identify, how we map the assets that are delegated, how we onboard our customers. And then secondly, the, the technical team is looking at where it is possible on a chain to build some kind of permissioning um, to allow delegation to a validator. They are doing that. So yeah, I think the, the message is that these these are very much a part of building the technology. They shouldn't be seen as, you know, anti the technology. And if you don't do it, as Simon says, we will end up with much stronger regulation that will not work at all. Yeah, thanks, Barbara. I mean, perhaps this is a good segue to Joshua to, to look into this issue of why, why is it important to consider the legal or regulatory aspect leading to blockchain and the digital assets that underpin it? So one of the reasons that it's important is that otherwise you don't have certainty. And it's already the case, right? It's quite true that many of these digital assets can cross lines, even when you have clear, bright lines and clear classifications. And if I just you know, provide the US perspective for a moment, in the US, we very rarely have clear lines about even clear things. So holding aside the fact that a digital asset can have many different characteristics, we have a situation where we not only have federal and state regulation, but we have several regulators, all of which could take jurisdiction, they believe, over the same digital asset. So the CFTC has said that nearly every digital asset, or basically every digital asset, is a commodity. And it also can be a security, because it's a different test. So the SEC has said nearly every digital asset offered and sold for fundraising purposes is a security. And FinCEN looks at digital assets as though they're substitutes for money. The IRS looks at it like it's intangible personal property. The OCC and Treasury, they look at it like, frankly, a little bit like money, but a little bit like, wait, this is tech that banks shouldn't necessarily be touching unless they're ready, right? Unless they've shown us that they are sufficiently sophisticated. So, and that's for the same digital asset. What I see in, in practice is that in many jurisdictions around the world, people are able to find classifications or get no action relief from their regulators, right? FINMA or someone else may say, oh, that's a utility token, right? This is, people are capable of doing this in so many jurisdictions. And what I find happens is when, when a client may want a global survey or need help creating a taxonomy of how to define digital assets and different kinds, what often happens is that many different jurisdictions can agree, and then we get to the US, and I have to say, it's facts and circumstances, right? And oh, we need to look at the transaction. We don't just look at the characteristic of the token. How is it marketed? How is it offered? How is it sold? And this can bring things sometimes to a standstill. So I think we're seeing a lot of innovation. It's feared that it will continue to flow out of the US. And I think right now Congress is focused on at least considering ways to have additional clarity because the clarity doesn't exist under the law. No. Well, continue. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, to be the last one to speak after such a three great intervention is quite difficult, but I'll just add a little bit of a line. Uh, I'm an, not a lawyer, so I'll just make this disclaimer. Oh, I have very renowned judges and you know, members of different uh, very famous institutions, uh, but I'm not a lawyer. Um, my perspective comes more from an industry perspective. And, but I do agree that definition of the term, and what we're talking here about definition of uh, permissionless versus uh, permission blockchain, and the definition itself is very important, but it's not enough. 
So I, I'll borrow one sentence from Socrates 400 years ago. The beginning of wisdom is the definition of terms. So who am I to disagree? So I think this is very important definition that my colleagues are very expert on, but in my opinion, this does not mean much if we don't know what to do with that. If we don't have a clear definition of who is going to be responsible for taking a leadership in regulating that specific industry with that definition that we can discuss. So what I think that some countries, we have a very clear definition of who is the regulator for securities, who is the regulator for banks, who is regulated for commodities, but we do not have in many countries who is regulated for digital assets. Some of my colleagues, much more expert than I, would say, well, this doesn't matter because if it's a digital asset but touch securities or touch commodities, they are both. But what we're missing is an act, like we have a Securities Act, we are missing a Digital Asset Act. Some countries are going to that initiative. Mika, for instance. Brazil, for instance. We cannot fool ourselves that in all this, sorry, in a polite way, jungle of laws, we can really identify users like me and trying to do our best investment, what is what, what is not, and there's huge debate. So my point, and I've just finished here, definition is important. Not only of the terms, but who is going to regulate it. We are missing the US, we are missing some countries, a digital acts law, a digital assets act. That's my humble opinion. Thank you. I think the next set week of questions is to look at what are the practical challenges legal impediments, barriers that one needs to overcome before you see more wider adoption of blockchain technology in financial services, but also the wider adoption by the masses. So I can start then, this time. To be honest, I think a combination of regulatory uncertainty, and let me caveat that, a specific missing digital act uh, Digital Asset Act, together with uh, very strong enforcement actions, is the worst barrier of adoption that you can have. If you combine those two facts, it's very strong to get adoption. We saw this happen in the first half of 2021 when we saw migration of Bitcoin mining from China to the US. We saw there was uncertainty regarding the regulation, but there was at the same time a crackdown. In China, 2019 was responsible for three quarters of every uh, of, of the world's total hash rate to mine, three quarters, more than 75%. But the ban of mining, and they are not, I don't have a proper word, but the witch hunting of miners that's in China led to estimate 500,000 Chinese miners to look for homes in the US, 500,000. At the end of the year, China's global share dropped to 18%, from 75 to 18%. And the US became uh, the leader with more than that, almost 40. So, now we might see a new migration out of the US because we have the same combination of regulatory uncertainty and enforcement. In my humble opinion, again, this is the worst barrier for adoption. Thank you. Uh, Joshua, if I can end up. Thanks. So I think there are a number of different things, and one of them, I think, crosses legal regimes. It's not even necessarily... UI, UX, right, user experience, um, right? <laughs> I think that's something that, as that comes along, that will help usher in um, greater adoption. I think things are still challenging for people who aren't necessarily technologically adept. But I think from a legal perspective, looking at the US, there are a few different, different waves of ways that the government um, and regulators have found to keep pension funds and other large, you know, big moves into the space from really experiencing digital assets. So one of those is, and we'll see if, if the recent announcement by BlackRock and Coinbase, whether this changes it, but with respect to, for example, ETFs, ETPs, exchange traded products, right? One of the reasons that the SEC has given for not approving the rule change is that there's insufficient market surveillance. 
right? Here we now see it's been at least reported in Coindesk just today, right, that um, there is some sort of surveillance sharing agreement that who knows, maybe that will make a difference. But many believe that the reason that, the real reason that things haven't been approved is to stop the masses from entering digital assets and to keep it off to the side. What I'll just say really quickly is another place I see this, I see shades of it at least, or perhaps, is with this SEC's new proposed uh, expansion of the custody rule to be a safeguarding rule, right, where there's a limited number of qualified custodians and, you know, many believe and there is some evidence that banks and others are being sort of persuaded or um, encouraged or otherwise not to be serve as qualified custodians for a variety of reasons. And Chairman Gensler of the SEC has said that the exchanges, even if they say that they are qualified custodians, that they may not be, right? Of course, it's case by case, and this is just what he's saying. It hasn't been proven. But what I see is if you have an expansion of this rule that says right now that customer assets, that our securities or funds have to be held by qualified custodians, and that's actually expanded to be all customer assets held by investment advisors would have to be held by qualified custodians. If you have a shrinking or stable pool of qualified custodians and they're getting a massive push for all kinds of assets, broader than digital assets, that they have to custody, guess what? Either the price is gonna go through the roof and that'll be passed on to customers or maybe they just will find digital assets too risky to custody. And what does that do? That will drive, I believe, investment advisors and others away, right? And it will require individuals to participate directly. Now, again, that goes back to user experience, and there's a lot of risks that come into play. I mean, it is true, this is the last thing I'll say, not your keys, not your crypto. But at the same time, sometimes professional advisors and others, they know more about the market, they have more experience with buying and selling swiftly, um, and you know, there are different kinds of risks if you, if the only way in is by yourself. Thanks. Um, I think this is a really huge question and we're unlikely to get all the answers. And I think just from the perspective that I come from, which is building businesses, you know, from the ground up, there are so many issues that you come across um, that are, you know, sit in the legal and regulatory sphere. And one example that we have agonized over and, and examined is just about shares and whether they can be traded digitally and whether you can represent a share register on the blockchain. And that takes a different um, analysis depending on which jurisdiction you're in. And in the UK, one of the things that you know makes it very complicated is a 19th century act. Um, so there are sort of interventions that would need to be made in order for certain um, mechanical processes to, to, to take place. And that's very important and that will need to happen. I'm going to pass the buck slightly and say that I think that all these legal and regulatory challenges can be overcome, but you've got to think about what blockchain is doing and you've got to think about when you're building a product, what, what is it that, that you're trying to solve, what, what are you trying to improve and who's going to participate in that. And one of the biggest challenges that we're coming across when we're you know, trying to start these new business models is that blockchain is actually gonna drive disintermediation of current market players and they don't like it. And so if you need them on board to help you with the early stages of a project, that can be a challenge. So I think you have to be sensitive to the fact that even if you can get over the legal and regulatory challenges, there are gonna be market participants who are gonna resist this as well. And so it will take some time. Um, so yeah, it's not all the fault of the, the lawyers and the regulators in this instance. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I, realistically, this only works properly when you have large institutional investors regarding these as assets they can comfortably deal with. For as long as crypto is perceived as sort of the Wild West inhabited by people brave enough to take legal risks, we have a problem. So imagine yourself a trustee of a conservative um, pension fund saying, mm. can we invest in this crypto stuff? Well, basically, you've got to ask yourself three questions. One of them is, how do I know it's been validly transferred to me? You know, when you buy a house, you get conveyance. When you transfer shares, you go through Crest. 
what's the equivalent? How do I know it's been validly transferred to me? Second question is what we call settlement finality. How do I know that it can't be clawed back again? And the third question is how do I hold it for the period in which I'm invested in it? Which goes precisely to Joshua's points about no investor is going to invest unless they're confident in the custody arrangements. And by the way, that's really hard for the custodians. Um, a word which, if you haven't come across, you should. Um, common in financial markets amongst the cynics amongst us, it, it, it's the concept of the bezel. This was invented by J.K. Galbraith, and it refers to the volume of assets in the system which have already been stolen, but people don't know it yet. <laughs> All financial systems have a bezel in them somewhere. How big it is varies from time to time. But as my hypothetical pension fund investor, that gives you to your fourth question, which is, if somebody has managed to get their hands on my assets, can I get them back again? How confident am I that I can assert my ownership against you know, the criminal clerk or whoever who's managed to siphon them off? All four of those are at heart property law questions. Property law, as I said earlier, just has not caught up with this class of assets yet. It is catching. There's very good work being done by the likes of Unsertral on this. But the honest answer is that this will not become a mainstream asset until the basic property law concepts are sufficiently clear that mainstream conservative investors don't have to worry about them. That's actually quite a high bar, but we are getting there. Thank you. I think that's a good segue to the question of what's the current landscape? What's the current lay of the land with respect to the major jurisdiction where we are in? I think the first thing we'll start off is here in the United Kingdom. Perhaps we'll start off with you, Barbara, in terms of looking at what's the current landscape, what is the principal regulators, whether the HMT, the PRA, and the FCA are doing about this in this area of providing legal certainty for crypto assets? Sure. Um, I should probably admit to begin with that the, in the businesses that we're building, we're pretty agnostic about which jurisdiction we're in, and we have an assessment, um, a, a jurisdiction framework that we run through for our MVP and any businesses that we're building. And as yet, we've not chosen the UK to start any of our businesses. Now, that doesn't mean we won't you know, expand the businesses to here, but um, I, I think that's probably quite telling um, to begin with. So from a legal perspective, um, I think the English court system and, and our judges um, are, are, have, been, have, performed, have performed well in dealing with this. And you know, that is how you know, English common law has developed. It is flexible and judges are able to make assessments of new technologies and, and adapt the law accordingly. I think that's been positive. I think there's been really good work by the UK Jurisdiction Task Force and also the Law Commission. Um, so the Law Commission came out a couple of years ago and said that smart legal contracts were enforceable under English law. And that's great because it starts to bring that certainty that we don't have. Um, they've also consulted on property law. Um, that's a 400 page consultation if you want to learn about the origins of English property law, it's a good starting point. Um, and then more recently, they've, I think uh, sort of towards the end of last year, they did a consultation on, on decentralized autonomous organizations and how that might fit into the current legal system. So I think that's a really positive message. You know, the, the legislator, legislature is, is considering it, government is considering it, and the judiciary is considering it. So. Um, it's not going to keep pace with the technological development, but it is not being blocked or ignored. So kind of, I, I feel quite positive about that. From the regulatory perspective, um, we've touched on this, but as of today, there is no dedicated framework for digital assets in the UK. And as Simon has said, they, they don't necessarily fit neatly into the current categories. And that's exactly what the FCA um, did, is that they came out and said, we, this is in 2019, they said there are three different categories. We've got security tokens, e-money tokens, and unregulated tokens. Um, and, and as we've touched on, it doesn't necessarily um, sit easily in those categories, but 
the, the regulations and the rules that you have to follow flow from those specific categories. Um, and it's a slightly different debate to, to what happens in, in the US, but there are sort of similar, similar concerns. Um, and I think it's probably fair to say that the FCA has not tried to take the approach of um, regulation by enforcement. So there's been very limited action by the FCA, which you can see as a, as a, as a positive, I suppose it's allowed um, innovation. Most recently this month, um, the FCA came out with the um, policy statement um, and the near final rules on financial promotions to retail investors. And they've decided that crypto assets are restricted um, uh, uh, securities, that, so they, they basically um, fall into a category of uh, assets that are not easily tradable, um, so they're, they're not readily realizable securities, they're restricted mass market investments. Um, and the consequences of this are sort of being worked through by a lot of businesses. It's not something that we are dealing with because, and again, this is telling, that the businesses that we're building, we've just said retail, and that's customers, so you know everyday people, We've taken the view that it's too hard and, and too uncertain. But again, taking a step back, if, you're, if you are building a business and you're saying, you know, I want the certainty, what the regulator has said and what HMT has said is there's more coming. Um, and that, that's a hard environment to build in. It's a hard environment to invest in. Um, and, and, you know, and it, it's just not going to help with the overall adoption. So I can understand why they've taken this approach. Um, but I think it's very hard for, for business and, and for innovation, and it will, it's gonna take some time to work its way through. Thanks, Barbara. Gui, from your sort of market expectation perspective, what have been your experience in dealing with the current regulatory landscape? Thank you. Uh, I think um, since we'll be covering the UK, US in more depth, I would like to, to cover one uh, recent case that we have been studying quite, quite a lot, and we are very impressed. Uh, is actually the landscape in some emerging market countries, which are take a very different approach. Uh, I, take, I give an example, the uh, case of Brazil. Case, Brazil is one of the countries where adoption of uh, blockchain crypto is one of the uh, largest in the world, and the regulator has been very constructive and proactive. So last December 2022, there was a Digital Asset Act which was uh, giving the central bank, it was published by the, by the, the Congress and it was giving the central bank undoubt responsibility and power to regulate the sector. Uh, and the central bank is very ambitious and they are actually running a pilot using Hyperledger Bezos, which is a permission version of Ethereum to create a national layer zero blockchain where all the assets and liabilities of all the regulated financial institutions are going to be recorded. So when you make a deposit in a bank, the bank gives automatically a stable coin. This is happening today. These pilots today, like today's Sunday, but you know, this week, it is happening now that countries, uh, banks are now with the central bank receiving deposits automatically convert into stable coins. And the Hyperledger basis layer zero are going to make com compatible all the stable coins for the different banks which are regulated. They have a CBDC, which is a wholesale CBDC, which settles all the balances real time between all the banks. Don't need to need well, overnight, it's all real time CBDC, wholesale CBDC, which settle and clear all the balance between the banks real time. And very interesting, they are piloting with Bradesco, Santander, Banco do Brasil, big banks, to do uh, atomic settlement on loans. So if you have a car loan, because Brazil is a civil law, you need to do a proper registration when you sell the car in a registry, government registry for the transfers of the car. So now what happens in on blockchain is that by, when you pay the last installment of debt, uh, um, car loan with a stable coin, automatically that is transferred, that register is transferred to you. And that's lending, this is happening today. So I'm just saying that's super visionary. It is amazing actually that this case, uh, there is one company that, you know, I, I, I've just closed my, my uh, potential conflict of interest here. There is one, one company talking about this that we are invested in the emerging markets panel at three o'clock. In, in one of the rooms. Uh, so I think it's worth hearing from the company. This technology company is helping the central bank to do this. 
And we were super impressed when we came across that. So I'll just share this, because for me it's one of the most concrete examples of changing uh, the infrastructure of the financial services without actually changing any law. All the participants in the regulator, the, the, the operators of the nodes the, the, are actually regulated banks. It's very interesting. So I just want to share this one. Thank you. I think with that, we we'll look at the US. I think Joshua earlier talked about the United States. There's been a number of measures taken out from by the White House, uh, the sort of US senators, and a number of bills is good to get a take in terms of what's the lay of the land in terms of the regulatory landscape. Thanks. So yeah, I mean, I think what's going on in terms of the regulatory landscape is a lot, right? And it depends often on what question you're asking. I'll just start that, that way. Because if you're asking, what does the regulator think? So if you're advising a client, right, and you're a regulatory lawyer, you say, what does the regulator think? You may get one answer, right? And if you say, what can be proven in a court? Because you're a litigator, right? You may get a completely different answer. And then if you ask, well, what is happening in Congress? And will that change everything? You may get yet a third answer. And so I think that's important to remember. And a lot of times you may hear practitioners and, and projects in the space and others having really big arguments, but often they're arguing different things. Um, and so, for example, you can say, okay, it's pretty clear just to pick on the SEC for a second. And I should say, if we didn't say this before, none of this is legal advice, investment advice, any other kind of advice. And it's our personal views. I think I probably speak for everyone um, only. So, so yeah, you can say with the SEC, okay, the SEC thinks nearly every digital asset offered and sold for capital raising purposes is a security, right? And you can hear Chairman Gensler say all kinds of things to that effect. But that doesn't mean that that's what the law is going to be determined because it's facts and circumstances in each case and that will be determined by a court unless someone settles. So I think what we're seeing now, we've seen a raft of enforcement really um, across regulators, but particularly lately from the SEC and the CFTC. And I think what's really interesting to see is that it's happening alongside vigorous debate in Congress about potential new bills. Now, unfortunately, post FTX and the aftermath of that, there is a lot of part of, even more, it's even more of a partisan issue than most issues right now. So the, the challenge is that while there are some huge supporters in Congress of digital assets and of providing you know, a, a specific market structure bill, market infrastructure bill, at least with respect to that bill, right now, it, there's not one Democrat on that bill. Is that likely to pass? Well, you know, let's see, <laughs> right? But so there's that. And so there are people who are very importantly trying to usher this in. But at the same time, you have to contend with the existing rules. And what the SEC is trying to say, for example, I'll just stay with them for a moment, is look, we don't need new laws. Right? And they're trying to say, especially in some of their most recent enforcement actions against trading platforms that have come out just you know, over the past few months, but even in just the past couple of weeks, some of the biggest um, that there are in terms of trading platforms, they've not only aggregated lots of different claims that they've brought against various players over the years, they've brought out some new revelations. So while we heard a lot come in and register to the trading platforms, we did not hear come in and register, and by the way, break apart all of your existing processes and register each of those separately. And so I think, in my view, what I see is the SEC trying to provide a roadmap of how they think things fit together to say, look, we've got it covered. At the same time, the SEC has been being asked to provide rules for a long time because it has a rulemaking ability. I think their view on this is kind of you wanted rules, let's see if you like what you get. Because the expansion of the definition of exchange, potentially, and you know the safeguarding rule, you know what, that makes it a lot easier for the SEC to say, hey, you don't have to figure out which of these digital assets are securities. You don't have to, you know, we don't have to argue over whether something's passive or active for an exchange. You know, they're covering all bases, and I think, I. I think obviously many in the industry are upset about it, 
one thing I, I think is really important to remember, and we've heard a lot from Chairman Gensler of the SEC, and he's been saying a lot of things lately, some of which have nothing to do with securities. Like his statement that we don't need, new, we don't need digital currency, we have the dollar. What does that have to do with securities? The SEC is supposed to be merit neutral. It's supposed to be technology neutral. It's supposed to be a disclosure regime. And so I think it's just important, you know, things may be said in the speeches and that doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it what the court will say, and I think we're going to see a lot of legal battles. Just two quick things. One is the CFTC has been active too, and maybe we'll talk about, well, if we talk later about DAOs and stuff, we can get into that. But many people had thought, oh, they're the easier regulator. They're the easier regulator. We want them. You know, but they're not the easier regulator. They might be a smaller regulator, but all of these regulators have teeth. Um, and so I, I think this is all, maybe I'll just leave it there in terms of, of my answer. Thanks, Joshua. I think the other piece of relates to MICA, market in crypto uh, regulations. I think we do have Simon here to provide the perspective of, of MICA. For those of you know, who, who might not be aware what MICA stands for, it's a sort of watershed moment that the European regulators have got together to provide a benchmark regulations on crypto assets across the European continent. It would be good to hear from Simon what MICA covers, the importance of MICA for the crypto ecosystem, what does it mean for sort of Britain in terms of being part or close to the region as well? Yes, thanks. Um, I mean, MICA is the European Union's great experiment in regulating the market before the market existed, which is going to be interesting to watch. Um, MICA started as a slightly panicky response to uh, Facebook's Libra uh, DM proposal, and part of its core is some rules on asset reference tokens which basically say we refuse to allow these filthy foreign asset tokens to uh, circulate in Europe. If you want to circulate these things in Europe, you have to be, ba you have to be established in Europe and effectively regulated as a bank. So we're not, we, won't, we hear no more of those. Um, what it does, it, it, slightly more helpfully, it does think quite hard about the concept of electronic money tokens by which it means tokens which are stabilized against a specific currency. And effectively what it's saying there is, these are fine, provided that you produce a white paper, which is totally useless, and um, that you, all the money you receive in respect of your tokens you hold in a client account somewhere where we can see it, um, which is kind of helpful. That's unless the currency you're referencing is the euro, in which case the ECB will come and stamp on you until you stop. Um, what, it, what we then have is a class which can helpfully be described as all other tokens. Now, interestingly, all other tokens is split into two fairly big categories because anything that is already regulated as a security or anything that falls within the scope of securities regulation falls outside MICA and we have to work out what to do about it. So we've actually got all of the problems that the US has in this regard. It's just whereas the US is sort of actively engaged in fighting the border wars, uh, they haven't really started in Europe. But the fact that we have two entirely separate regulatory regimes, one for things that are securities and one for things that aren't, is, is, is going to be quite fun to watch. By the way, there's a fascinating and rather subtle point here which is going to become very important, and that is this. If I sell you an asset and record the ownership of that asset on a blockchain, have I sold you a crypto asset or have I sold you a normal asset and recorded your ownership of that asset in crypto form? The more we, the, 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 more the border wars develop, the more we discover this is actually a much harder thing to define than we thought it was. And it's, it's, as I say, that that's, that's all still to come. Um, the other two big bits of this, for my mind, um, we have a regime cover, covering crypto asset service providers, so the people 
who were allowed to look after these things, which is helpful because the current um, custody provision directive effectively says custodians can't hold crypto assets, which is slightly unfortunate because it's just like, well, who the hell else is going to custody them other than custodians? But we've now at least got a way through that. And there's an attempt to apply some of the uh, securities market abuse regime to crypto. Um, one or two people have looked at this, commented on how successful this has been in preventing abuse of the securities markets and wondering whether it's really worth the paper it's written on. But at least it's, at least it's a first try, at least it's an attempt, and you have to give them credit for that. But the important thing about this, as I say, is rather than waiting to see what the market does and then regulating it, what Europe is doing is sort of regulate first, market later. And the interaction between that and the development of crypto in Europe is potentially going to push the development of crypto in Europe in, a, in some different directions to the way it goes in the rest of the world. So it, it's, it, it's potentially very significant. Thank you. I think the other thing I want to touch on is on the concept of DAO, Decentralized Autonomous Organization. So maybe very quickly. Thanks. So DAOs. I guess if we look back to 2017 or 2016 when the DAO, the, the DAO first had a token sale, I mean, it sure caught the attention of the SEC back then, right? Because they issued a 21A report called the DAO in 2017, which is kind of their line in the sand. So it's really been an interesting, at least from those with whom I've, I've spoken, just who, who may or may not be friends um, at regulators, that the concept of DAOs has really resurged, including investment DAOs, and that people are not realizing that the SEC may think that many of those are involve securities, despite the DAO report. But more broadly, I think what the SEC did in t April 2019, when it announced a framework um, for how it interprets the Howey test, which is our investment contract test in the US. As well as the Hinman speech, which has made headlines in recent days um, in the Ripple case where some of the emails came to light. But what, what both of these things did was focus on decentralization, right? And, and there was a, a key phrase that was only used once, but it was important in Hinman's speech, which was sufficiently decentralized. Now you may say, what does that have to do with securities laws? Well, if you know the Howey test in the US, I, I won't belabor it, but it's, is there an investment of money in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profit based solely or primarily on the managerial or entrepreneurial efforts of others? So did you give someone money to rely on their efforts to give you a profit, right? And so the question of decentralization goes to the question of whether there are those others that you rely on. Or is it just so diffuse that you're not really relying on identified folks? Okay, so what this kind of kicked off was this idea of, well, some have called it decentralization theater, right? Where all of a sudden, everyone was saying they were decentralized, even if it was only in name, right? The concept decentralized in name only, right? And also, people began to think that this applied to all different kinds of legal regimes. Right? People were thinking, oh, well, then I don't have to worry about KYC AML. Oh, I don't have to worry about sanctions. And what we saw with Treasury, um, they gave a report recently in the US saying actually decentralization is totally irrelevant to whether you have to you know, screen for money laundering and terrorist financing and the like. Just as a reminder, and now what we've seen in terms of enforcement in the US, we've seen a couple of really important cases as well as some statutes spring up. So there had been, there are, for a couple of years, there's been a Wyoming statute that allows a DAO wrapper for an LLC, and there are some other states that followed that route. What we've seen more recently, and this I think was really kicked off in a way by the CFTC's case against Uki DAO, right? They, they basically said, we're gonna take a look at the people who are actually exercising governance rights via the governance tokens, and we're gonna try and hold them liable. We're, gonna, we're going to serve them, et cetera. And they made this determination, they kind of split the, the baby, so to speak, right, on who they'd hold liable. And we just saw that they just got a default judgment the other day 
um, in, in their favor. It made headlines, but it was a default judgment because I guess no one responded, right? What we've seen also in states, the Northern District of California had the predecessor DAO for BZ DAO, BZX DAO, I mean, which was the predecessor for Uki DAO. And they, BZX DAO was sued in Northern California under the theory of a general partnership, an unincorporated association, and that there was a duty of care, right? And that it was foreseeable that certain hacks would occur. And actually, the court there found that, you know what, there was actually potentially liability for negligence. So since then, and I'll wrap it up, certain states, including I believe Utah, California, others, have either passed or introduced legislation that would have unincorporated associations, DAOs, have a legal identity, but where the individual people, notwithstanding that it would be an unincorporated association, where they would not have this general partnership liability. So that's where we are with that. Thanks, Joshua. Just on the Where's the future direction of, of um, onwards over still and upwards is the answer. Um, you know, all of these questions will be answered in time. The there is a huge amount of cost to be taken out of the financial services industry and a number of other costs. That will be the driver of technical development. I mean, I think there are goodness knows how many possibilities out there, but the key thing now is to identify where can people make real money out of this. And actually the boring business of taking out settlement costs is going to be the driver. I, I think, you know, will there be more regulation? Yes, we know that's coming. Um, why, you know, how do we think about that when we're building businesses and coming up with ideas? For us, um, it's actually really problematic to not have regulation and to have this uncertainty. Um, and I think I would distinguish it between saying wrong regulation will stifle innovation and no regulation will stifle innovation. But just to give a really practical example of what that means day to day when I'm trying to help the teams I work with set up their companies and their projects, it's really hard to get a bank account. And if you can't get a bank account, you're limited as to what you're gonna do. You can build all the code that you want, but you're never gonna be able to transact in the real world, which today is still necessary. The second thing that we struggle with all the time is if you think the financial services industry moves slowly, the insurance sector moves at a glacial pace, and they have yet to understand technology and they hear all the bad things that happen and, and they, you know, they really aren't um, engaging with it. And to, again, to give a concrete example of what that means, we came across a project um, and they wanted, they had a company and they wanted to put in place directors and officers liability insurance. And the only uh, cover they could get was a premium. They would have had to pay $60,000 for $300,000 of cover. And to compare that to, you know, a non-blockchain business, it would be 5,000 for three to 5 million of cover. That makes it unworkable. Um, so I think there are really fundamental aspects of building a business that other participants can't engage with you unless they know that you're a good actor. And the way they know you're a good actor is if there are regulations and you're supervised and you're complying with those. So I think in the US, you know, we can hope for new laws, we can push for new laws, but I think ultimately a lot of this is gonna come down to the court, right? So these are cases that are going to be ongoing for years. And so I think there's gonna be a period of continuing uncertainty about what the end result will be. Um, I do think in the meantime, we do have existing laws and at least we know how the regulator is likely to think. So I think um, I would caution those who are looking to, um, to sell into the US various things. Um, I would caution you not to assume that the rest of your approach for the, much of the rest of the world um, will be applicable in the US and that I would just, you know, seek legal counsel. <laughs> thank you, I know we just have one minute left. Uh, thank you for the organization. Just Sorry, I think the, the future is bright. It's going to take time. 
It takes about 30 years for the regulator to get right a regulation, a regulatory framework after innovation. Uh, I was looking to history uh, in when I was you know, in, the, in the position at the University of, of Oxford Blockchain Research. And if you look even Facebook today, content creation is still being regulated, now it's taking a while. So it's about 30 years. The funniest story that I have, and I promise half a second, is that when the government, UK government uh, passed a law in 1865 to regulate cars, because cars are super dangerous. Like people can get killed. And so they called the Locomotive Act. 1865. So the regulation was the following. If you want to have a car, because they knew how to regulate trains, you need to have a driver. So you hire a driver, like in a train. You need someone to put the fuel. Okay, two people already you need to hire. Okay, fine. And then you only had three spaces at the time, so you only one person. And then the most interesting thing is that you need to hire a guy or lady, someone to be running in front of the car with a red flag to warn pedestrians and horse chariots that there was a very dangerous machine coming. That's why the expression in English, this is a red flag, come from there. It's Red Flag Act. So it took 30 years, from 1865 to 1896, for them to think, oh, maybe we could have seat belts. Oh, for security, maybe we could have uh, you know, stop signs and, and traffic lights, then have the red men running. But again, it takes time for the regulation to come, but I'm very positive we will come. Thank you. Thank you. With that, please thank my distinguished speakers for great insight. Thank you.